With our Bibles turned open to Philippians chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 14 through 20. This is not a formality. God is addressing us this morning. The worship did not end when Ebenezer stepped down off of this stage. It only continues, but it continues in a different way. It continues through our hearts, ready to receive what God has for us today. Please follow along as God addresses us from Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 20. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I've received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever. Endeavor. Amen. If you sow your seed, you will not be in need. Friend, if you're in need, sow your seed. If you want your blessing, you have to first give your financial gift. If you're waiting for your blessing and you still haven't received it, it's because God is waiting for your sacrificial tithe. Harvest responds only to seed, not to prayer. If you're not harvesting blessings, it's because you've not sown your financial seed. If you're suffering, that's because you're not giving your money to God. I see your faces. Is that right? You're a well-trained church. That's garbage. <laughs> That's garbage. That's Creflo Dollar. That's Kenneth Copeland. But it ain't Bible, and it's definitely, definitely not the free grace of God. It's not the free grace of the gospel. Now you say amen. amen. You know what's going around right now. Give 2,000 burr, 20,000 burr to the hot new prophet on the block, and God's going to give you a Yuzalalem ATM card. <laughs> you can use it at any bank you want. Go to any bank and you get unlimited funds straight from heaven. It goes right to you if you get this ATM card. All you got to do is give your 20,000 burr to the prophet first. Amen? <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, no, Amen. You know, I heard a story yesterday of a sister who had a couple of businesses. She had a couple of businesses, and she was welcomed into the church, and she kept giving. She kept giving all of her money to the churches, and she's waiting for her blessing to come. You know what the end product was? She didn't have a business anymore. And she had no money left to give. And distraught, discouraged... She ends up not going to church anymore. She stopped going to church. You see, what happened was she ran out of money and she stopped trusting God. She had been trusting these prophets. Well, here's what happened. Some of these prophets, they found her on the corner of the street one day. And they didn't even acknowledge her existence. They walked right by her. Now she's nothing to them. Why? Because all of her money was right here right here in their pocket. Do you see what her ticket was? Her ticket was not Christ. Her ticket wasn't free grace. Her ticket was the moolah, the money. And once she gave all of her money away, 
her ticket was gone. Trinity Fellowship, we're drawing near to our one-year anniversary, the one-year anniversary of our official launch. But have you noticed we have not taken an offering? The reason for that is because we've wanted to make a loud statement with our actions. Statements like this. We're not trying to get rich off of you. God doesn't need your money to bless you. The church in recent days has had over a hundred attenders and we're not taking up a collection for money, not even once yet. What we want to say is that grace is free. You don't have to pay for it. I'll be your pastor. We will be your church. I'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. We'll love you. And you don't need to give us even one burr. Your money is not your ticket into Trinity Fellowship. Christ paying your debt. That, brothers and sisters, that is your ticket. Nevertheless, in our text for today, the topic is that of giving. And we find that the giving of money is actually a very biblical thing. In fact, the giving of money is an act that can touch the very heart of God. But before we get into it, here's what we need to do. Before we get into our text, we need to correct two false understandings, two wrong ways of thinking that are floating around our city concerning the giving of money. The first wrong way of thinking that we need to interact with is this. I should give my money to God because there's this automatic blessing that happens to me when I give. There's an auto automatic blessing in store if I give to God. Let me give a, a brief uh, breakdown of this. Under this error, giving to God has been twisted. The biblical teaching of giving to God, it's been twisted into a form of spiritual manipulation. It's taken the truth concerning God's favor being upon those who give generously, and it's perverted it into a sinful pursuit of materialism, which is condemned by Christ, the New Testament, and all of Scripture. And it does this in the name of Christianity. And the end product of this error is often the accumulation of wealth in the pockets of so-called prophets and apostles and pastors. Now there's a number of Bible verses that these prophets, apostles, and pastors like to use to support this false teaching. And one of the main ones comes from Malachi 3.10. Perhaps you know it. This is how it reads, bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby, thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. But friends, this text is being taken out of context. The context was that of Israel becoming apostate. That means they had abandoned God. They had stopped believing or following God. And the way that this verse is often preached is as though we are paying God. We pay God so as to receive our blessing. But friends, this form of thinking, it's actually condemned. It's condemned in the Bible. Let me give you an example of Christ or of the New Testament condemning this way of thinking. If you'll remember in the book Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 8, we have Simon the Magician. Simon the Magician offers to pay money so as to receive the gifts of God. This is what Peter says to him. When Simon offers to pay money to the apostles, the apostle Peter responds, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. So, this morning, here's my question for you. Would the prophets of Addis Ababa say that? 
Would they say, let your money die with you because you think you can obtain the gift of God with money? The entire Bible condemns this concept of spiritual manipulation in which if you give, you will automatically receive. There's a second wrong idea about giving. And that's that Christians are required to give a tithe of 10%. This belief turns the giving of 10% into a law that is a mandatory requirement for every Christian. Well, firstly, we, mean, we need to understand where this idea comes from. The, in, the New Te- in the Old Testament, we find that tithing, that is the giving of 10% of all that one makes, it was, in fact, required for all Israelites. We first discover Abraham tithing to Melchizedek, a tenth of the spoils from war in Genesis chapter 14. This tenth of the spoils is where we find this idea of 10% coming from. And this giving of 10%, it continued all throughout the book of Genesis. And then we find God commanding the Israelites to tithe. He commands them to do it. And the book of Numbers, and again in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 12, 5 through 6 says, But you shall seek the place of the Lord your God will choose. This is God talking. There you shall go. And there you shall bring your tithes. So God was commanding the Israelites to tithe. And then finally, we find this practice continuing all the way through to Malachi. Well, the purpose of this tithe was to give back to God. It was to provide the tribe of Levi with some financial support. If you remember, the the Levites, they had no inheritance when they came into the land. So this was God's way of providing for the Levites for their priestly ministry. That tithe was also used to give to the poor. And let me tell you something interesting. When everything was added up, it was actually quite a bit more than 10% that these Israelites were required to give to God. It was something like like 30-something percent that ended up going to God. Nevertheless, what I want you to see is that tithing in the Old Testament was something that they were commanded to do according to God's law. Now we come to the New Testament. Coming to the New Testament, we find that the Bible does not, the Bible does not impose the command to tithe to the followers of Jesus. Let me read a couple verses that show you the idea of how we relate to the law as New Testament Christians. Romans 6.14 declares that for those who are in Christ, we are not under the law, but we are under grace. In other words, the way we relate to the Old Testament civil and ceremonial law as New Testament believers may be summed up with Paul's words as found in Galatians 5.1 when he says, For freedom Christ has set you free. Stand firm therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. We're not slaves to the old law. Here's here's the thing, when this New Testament perspective, when it comes and is applied to the category of tithing money, here's what we find for the Christian. That we are not supposed to give from a sense of compulsion. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says this, Each Christian must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. This word compulsion, it means to be forced, to be constrained, bound to something. You have to do this, in other words. Under Old Testament law, the Israelites, they were forced to obey this. They were forced to this law of tithing. But in the New Testament, Paul says, you're not being forced. In other words, the law of tithing, it's been done away for the Christian. Here's what I'm trying to teach us this morning, Trinity Fellowship, that according to God's word, we're free. You're free. I hope you feel that. With regards to the money in your pocket, you're free. Indeed, we do find that the New Testament still teaches us to give, but not under compulsion. And certainly not because we're trying to buy God's blessings. Rather, we're to give 
from a heart of thankfulness, from a heart of gratitude and even joy in response to God. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 teaches us that God wants our money only, only when we give with right motives and from a heart of happiness. We're supposed to give from a place of cheer, from, from a place of joy. Let me give you an illustration. Anybody who's hung out with me late into the night knows that my, the quality of my humor as the night goes on goes like this. That's, there's the discipline right there. You, you, know, you know who you need to talk to. <laughs> Two weeks. <laughs> I don't even know what I was talking about anymore. <laughs> My humor goes down. <laughs> I, I begin to laugh at everything, things that are not funny. Uh, Josh recently said my humor becomes that of a junior high kid late into the night. Everything becomes funny. But for the Christian, everything is to be so filled with grace. I'm supposed to see grace in everything. Everything that comes to me, I'm supposed to say, I, what do I have that I wasn't given? Grace becomes my whole world. Kind of like my humor becomes my whole world at night. All I can see is funny stuff. All we can see is grace. Through the gospel, everything is supposed to see through the, be seen through the lens of joy, right? The Christian is supposed to see life like that. Everything is supposed to be so clearly full of grace that you can't help but feel joy. And it's from that joy-filled place that we give. Now, our text for today, our text for today is about giving from right motives. But I approach this text with something of a pastoral concern, something of a burden for some of you. Because I know that some of you have been abused by the false teaching of those who are in authority in this city. I know that some of you have suffered because you've given much of your money with this expectation that you're going to receive a blessing. And I want to stop and I want to pause and I want to address you if that's you. If you're in a place where you're skeptical of those in leadership, where you have given lots of money but you've never received your blessing, I want to make it clear that you don't need to give this to this church in order to receive a blessing from God. Do you hear me, brother? Do you hear me, sister? I want to encourage you not to give until you come to a place of trust, even a place of happiness. In fact, it's probably not a good thing for you to give until you come to a place in which you're able to give in response, in response to the free grace of God and not from a place of trying to win the blessing of God. So with that said now, turning to our text, it was a long introduction, but now Turning to our text, we need to make one brief initial observation before we get into our main points. The initial observation we need to make together is that, biblically speaking, giving to gospel ministry is in fact and actually giving to God. God considers that when we give to gospel ministry, not ministry, gospel ministry, there's many ministries. We're talking about gospel ministry. When we give to gospel ministry, we are, in fact, in the eyes of God, giving to Him. We find that this is clear in verses 16 and 18. In verse 16, the Philippians are giving money to Paul for gospel ministry. So much so that Paul says all of his needs are taken care of. They're caring for their pastor. They're caring for their church planter. But in verse 18, we see that God, actually God is the one who is seen as receiving this money that's being given to Paul, and it's being received as an acceptable and a pleasing sacrifice. And so what we find in our text is that giving to gospel ministry, or gospel ministers, is giving to God. With that said, our text for today is going to give us four good reasons why we should give to God. 
When we come to the New Testament and consider the early church and their patterns, we find that the New Testament actually has a lot to say about giving. Today, if there's going to be only one thing that you take away, if there's one thing that you walk away with this sermon understanding, if you get anything else, if you don't get anything else, let this be the thing. We should give to God because we are a people who are obsessed. We're obsessed with the free grace of God. We should give to God because we're a people who are obsessed with the free grace of the gospel. While we were still sinners, Christ came to us and he died for us. While we were still rebels, Jesus died on the cross for our rebellious sins. And we've been justified. We've been freely justified by his grace. We did nothing to deserve it. Why do we love God? Because he first loved us. And in response to this free grace, we desire our lives to be these great big signs back to God saying, Jesus, Jesus, thank you. I want my life to be a big sign to you that says, Jesus, thank you. We give our money to God because we are obsessed with the free grace of the gospel. Today we're going to see four biblical motivations for giving. And each one of them, each one of them is propelled, each one of them is pushed along by the free grace of God. Motivation number one. Motivation number one for giving. Give to God because God uses giving. Give to God because God uses giving. Verses 14 through 16 of our text read, It was kind of you to share my trouble. For you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except only you. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Here we're reminded of Paul's words in chapter 1, verse 5. If you've been with us through, from the beginning, we're reminded of what Paul said that he had this partnership, this partnership in the gospel with the Philippian church. The gospel was not merely Paul's apostolic ministry. Rather, it was both. It was both Paul and the Philippian church's ministry. They were in partnership together. And Trinity Fellowship, this is not my church. This is not my ministry. This is our ministry. This is our gospel partnership. This isn't Michael's church. Don't go out and call this Pastor Mickey's church. I'm not Pastor Mickey Hulet. <laughs> this is our gospel partnership. And here we see that for the Philippian church, this partnership, it was identified by their financial support for Paul so that he could minister. He could go out and minister in other locations. They had a gospel partnership, and it looked like Paul going, and they sending... Through financial support. And in our text, we find Paul pointing out evidences of grace. He's looking at the church and he's pointing out evidences of grace in their lives, and it's coming in the form of thanks, gratitude. He's quite confident that God is sovereign over all things, He's a sovereign God. He knows God does not need anything from man to carry out His will on earth. But Paul also knows this. He knows that God uses means to carry out his sovereign will. Last week we saw that God uses prayer to carry out his sovereign will. And this week we find that God uses money to carry out his sovereign will of advancing the gospel. Friends, if we take a step back right now, we recognize something I think is very interesting in this text. We'll observe something phenomenal about how God works. Because it's extraordinary to discover in these verses how God uses money to bring about his master plan. What we discover in these verses is that Paul's gospel ministry was essentially funded by this Philippian church. As we read through the Bible, who was funding his ministry? This Philippian church. In verse 14, Paul's trouble had become their trouble wasn't my trouble, it's our trouble, in other words. And so they wanted to help. And then we find in verse 15, they fund his ministry as he leaves Macedonia. Now, I want you to follow my logic. Lean in and follow what I'm about to say. About 30 seconds of logic here, okay? Macedonia is something of a, a, a reference to Philippi 
in our text. That's what most scholars believe. Most scholars believe Macedonia is a, a reference to Philippi itself. Philippi was in Macedonia, and there were other cities in Macedonia, but many scholars believe that when Paul says Macedonia right here, he's returning, he's referring to Philippi. And what we find in parallel verses at the end of Acts 16 is this, that we find Paul leaving Philippi. And then where does he go? Where does he go in Acts 17? He goes to Thessalonica. Well, if we look at our text for today, we find that once he was in Thessalonica, they continued to financially support the gospel ministry multiple times. Here's what that means. Here's what that means. Acts chapter 17, it essentially exists because God used money from the Philippians to send Paul. In other words, we would not have Acts 17 through 28 if the Philippians had not partnered with Paul through financial giving. That ought to stir you. That ought to affect you. This small Philippian church, friends, it was probably smaller than we are. And the individuals that made up this church, individuals that we've been introduced to throughout this study, such as Lydia, the international businesswoman, the jailer, the slave girl, Epaphroditus, the quarreling sisters of Iodia and Syntyche, and also Clement. These individuals who often seemed so insignificant in God's master plan, they were actually central. They were central in God's master plan. Because of them, because God was working in them and they were giving their money, the ministry of the gospel, it was able to continue. It was able to go forward. And we can even say this, that God used these Philippians and the giving of their money to give us big portions of our Bible. That's incredible. I think for many of us, we've grown up in a church culture that so emphasizes the importance of the leader or of the pastor or of the so-called prophet that we fall prey to thinking that we're actually really insignificant. It's the man of God, the man of God who's getting things done. But I want you to see that this, in this text, how, how God uses means. He uses means. The means that God used for Paul for the advancement of the gospel, those means were the faithful giving, the opening up of their purses and pockets, the purses and pockets of Philippi, the faithful giving of Philippi. And without this Philippian church, we probably would not have much of the New Testament that we have with us today. The gospel would not have been as fruitful. Listen, if these Philippians, if they had not been giving, we probably would not have the New Testament books of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. If it were not for the faithfulness of these Philippians, the book of Acts would have probably ended in chapter 16, or at least it would have been radically different. Paul would have gone through the rest of the book working and working and making tents and working some more and doing some some little gospel work. God uses ordinary people, brothers and sisters. He uses ordinary churches in extraordinary ways for the advancement of the kingdom. Friends, I can see this. I can see this in my own life, and I can see this in the establishment of Trinity Fellowship. If God had not given me my beautiful wife, who stood next to me and pushed me along for ten years, I don't know where I would be, but I wouldn't be here. I had bought a one-way ticket to Hawaii when I met my wife. And I didn't plan on ever coming back. If God hadn't given me Castleview, which sent me out to seminary and paid for my school and told me, you should go to Sovereign Grace Church of Louisville, I wouldn't be here today. God hadn't given me Sovereign Grace Church of Louisville and five amazing pastors who shepherded me, who trained me, who befriended me and and mentored me and sent me. I wouldn't be here today. 
If God had not given me Brother Ebenezer when I had no other partners, when it was just me and Canaan talking about an idea, if this brother had not agreed to work with me, we, we wouldn't be here today. If God had not given Ebenezer and myself the church planting team of approximately 14 brothers and sisters from this city who committed to one year of making this a reality, friends, none of us would be here today if it wasn't for the faithfulness of those 14 individuals. You probably don't even know all their names. If it wasn't for Joe and Caleb in the back who work every week to make this happen, we certainly wouldn't be this far along. If the three families who have moved all the way across the world to be with us solely to serve this local church, the Thomases, the Lewises, and the Pinnells, if they had not come out here to serve this church, we would not be this far along, friends. None of what we're experiencing today would be a reality. An army, an army of faithfulness, an army of faceless names, people that we don't even know, that you might not even know, they're needed to make this happen. They're giving. It was required to bring about this day, this day today, this Sunday, it required their faithfulness. God uses means, and Paul honored those means. He wasn't worried about them becoming prideful and saying, oh, you're great, brother. He wasn't worried. Paul honored those means. And here at Trinity Fellowship, we want to be intentional in honoring those means as well. We want to create a culture of pointing out evidences of grace in others and being thankful and honoring those people. Let me give you two little pieces of application. Application point number one. Philippians 4, 14 through 16. It should stir our hearts to give to God because we see that God uses giving. What might the Lord do in this country that we love if we give back to God? What might He do? He might do something you don't even think is possible. He's on a mission. He's on a mission to make his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And guess what, friends? The end is sure. The end is sure. We win. We win. And God will use our giving, your little burr, your little dollars. God's going to use that to make it happen. We give to God because God uses giving. Second piece of application We've seen that God uses means. So let me ask you a question. Are you grateful for the means that God has used in your life to teach you? Have you gone and thanked God for those means? Have you honored those individuals who have helped you along? If you've been helped, if you've been blessed, go back. Write a letter. Send them a text. Give them a phone call. Ask them out for coffee. And thank that person specifically. Tell them why. Don't just say thank you. Tell them why you're thankful and grateful for them. Motivation number two for giving to God. We give to God because it's not a gamble. We give to God because it's not a gamble. Continuing on in verse 17, Paul states, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Under this second point, we're talking about good works and the treasure that we are storing up in heaven when we do good works. What are good works? Good works are best understood when compared to dead works. What are dead works? Dead works are the good works that we do with the bad motive of winning approval or salvation from God. When an individual prays or evangelizes or doesn't drink or doesn't smoke or when he goes to church because he thinks that's going to make God love him and accept him, those are dead works. In fact, those are offensive to God because in effect we're stepping over, we're stepping over the free grace of God, we're stepping over Christ's gift to us, the crucified Christ, and we're trying to get salvation on our own by our own good works and our own gifts to God. Such works are in fact not good, rather they are dead works. But for the one who in humility trusts Jesus as the basis of salvation before God, that person 
That person is justified. That means he's declared right in the eyes of God based upon Christ's good work. Such an individual knows that there's nothing he can do to win God's approval. Rather, Jesus, Jesus paid all of his debts and now he wants to live a life of gratefulness to God and he wants to do good works in response to the free grace of the gospel. What we find for those individuals who have trusted in Christ to receive free salvation is that when they do good works, they're storing up rewards and treasure in heaven. As Jesus commanded in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And then we find Paul teaching the same thing, the same line of thinking. In 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, that's prideful, not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Now listen to this. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So indeed, we can say this. Some will have more treasure in heaven than others because they've given more. They've sacrificed more for the kingdom and they're going to receive more in the kingdom. But here's what's so scandalous. Every good work that we do is by His grace. Every good thing we do is by His grace. As we saw in 2.12, when we do good works, it is because God is working in us at the level of our desires. That's our will and our actions, our work. We're simply working out what God is working in. And we're going to be rewarded for that. That's scandalous, my friends. That is scandalous. Every good work that we do unto God, every good work for which we will receive a reward, we do it, we do those good works by His grace. We do it by His strength, His empowering work in our lives, and we're rewarded for it. Our every financial gift to God, it's never wasted. It's never lost. The application is quite evident, I think. When we give to God, it's not a gamble. Listen, this life, it's a, it's a vapor. It's a smoke. Here today and gone tomorrow. Today you're in your 20s. Tomorrow you're in your 60s. The next day you die. When you give to God, you're investing in eternity. You lose nothing. There's no gamble. There's a million things you could invest your money in. The city's blowing up. You have cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum. You have all of these buildings. People started investing. And they never finished. The city's full of buildings that have never been finished. They've been sitting like this for a decade. Never finished. Somebody started an investment. They couldn't finish it. Wasted dough. Wasted money. Bitcoin goes like this. You can invest today while it's low and think you're going to make a million, and then it goes even lower and you lose everything. When we give to God, it's a sure thing that our credit, our credit is going up in heaven. You want to invest somewhere that has rewards both in this world and in the one to come? Invest in His mission. Give to God because it's not a gamble. Here's the correct way we should think regarding giving and receiving with God. Look back at verse 15 for a moment with me. And again, I want you to take note what Paul says concerning our gospel partners. He says, no churches had entered into partnership with him, except Philippi only. What that means is that the credit that the church of Philippi was growing, it was more credit than other churches were growing. They were the only ones who were giving. In other words, some churches have more credit, they grow more credit, and some churches less credit because they give less. The churches that give more get more, the churches that give less get less. And some churches grow less credit because they give less 
to the gospel mission of God. Friends, this is crucial for us. This is crucial for us as we build a culture of giving in this church together. I don't know about you, but I want credit. I'm so aware that this life is going to be very short. I want to store up reward in heaven. Eternity is forever. So we must make up our mind from the outside, from the outset, to give. To give our lives, to give our hearts, to give our minds, to give our strength, to give our energy, to give our funds to the Lord. Give to God because it's not a gamble. Motivation number three for giving. Motivation number three for giving to God. Give to God because it makes God happy. Give to God because it makes God happy. Continuing on in verse 18, Paul says, I have received full payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Here, to our great surprise, we find that our giving, it pleases God. It pleases God. By His grace, not only will we be rewarded for giving to God, but oh my God, we can please our God. We can be pleasing to Him. Is it not an incredible thing to know that you can do things that touch the very heart of God? Is it not a deep delight to know that you can delight God? Let's be careful. Let's be careful to think rightly about God. God is not a beggar. He needs nothing from you. He's not waiting on the side of the road begging for your money so that he can pick his gospel mission back up. If only, if only that church would give me money, then my kingdom would come and my will would be done. I need you to obey. I need your money. No. That's not our God. Our God is in the heavens and He does whatever He pleases. Psalm 50.12 If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. God doesn't need our money to be happy. And yet, nevertheless, this text teaches us that giving to God is pleasing to Him. How so? Let's endeavor to understand how giving to God pleases him when it's done with correct motives. Remember, what is the foundation of your justification? Justification is being declared right in the eyes of God. How do we get that? How do we get to be right in God's eyes? What is the basis of our being found right in the eyes of God? Well, it's completely and only 100% the person and work of Jesus. It's the gospel. Now that means if you have trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation from your sins, in the eyes of God, you've become just as righteous as Jesus Himself. That means you cannot become more justified. You cannot become more justified in the eyes of God. And when you sin, it means you can't become less justified. That means God's pleasure in you It's not based upon your performance. It's not based upon the quality of your life over the past week. If you read your Bible every day over the last week, God's not more happy with you than he is with me, who only had a chance to read it five. So here's my test question. I want to make sure you get this. Before we move on, this is crucial for you to get. Here's my test question. It's only one question. Let's say there's a person who skipped church today. They're part of our church. They skipped church today and they stayed home and they fell into sin. Maybe maybe it's a young man who looked at pornography. While you are at church, you, on the other hand, you came to church and you worshipped God with the saints. Let's just say, for the sake of the argument, this brother that stayed home, he, he is a believer, okay? He's a Christian. You're a Christian. Here's my question for you. Which one of you is more justified? You who's here with us today or the brother who stumbled into sin who stayed home? Which one of you is more justified? If you think you're justified more than him, you're wrong. You actually don't 
yet understand justification by grace alone. Anyone who's truly believed in Jesus Christ from his heart is justified in Christ alone by grace alone. But here's the thing, the moment you actually become justified, the moment God declares you right in his eyes, we're supposed to start serving God. There's work to be done, good works that we're supposed to do for him. We're to grow in becoming more and more like Jesus. We're to grow in holiness. And here's what we find, that some grow more than others. Some grow faster, some grow more, some grow less. But the growth That is, when we do what is right in the eyes of God as justified Christians, we find that that is pleasing to God. It's honoring to Him. He likes, He enjoys when you obey His commandments. And so we may say that there are some who do more things as Christians that are pleasing to God than others. We see this with the woman who gave two copper coins, don't we? Christ looked at her as an example. She actually gave less than most people. She gave from her heart and she gave all that she had. Christ said she gave more than everyone else. Christ is looking at the motives. He's not looking at the quantity. He's looking at the quality. When we do it. The application for the Christian, friends, this ought to blow our minds. We who were once rebels... We with whom God was burning with anger, and friends, He was burning with anger according to Romans 1.18. We who before we were born again made God angry even with our good works because our hearts were so evil. Now that we have these new hearts, we're able to do things that are pleasing to God. What we find is that when we do, when we give, it pleases Him. And notice, again, it's the giving to God through gospel partnerships. Partnerships such as with ministers. Gospel ministries. Here in our text, the Philippians were meeting Paul's need. Paul's needs. And he says, I am well supplied. Listen, with great affection, with the deepest of affection for All of you, I tell you that by the grace of God, and only by the grace of God, I don't need one burr. I don't need one burr from any of you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 8-9, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. Listen, Paul didn't actually go rob churches, did he? He didn't go. He didn't go into the churches of Philippi and pistol whip them and say, give me your money so I can go do missions. No, he didn't rob. He didn't rob anybody. That goes without saying. What that means is that Paul received money. He gave, he received the giving of money, much money, from these Philippians so that he would not be a burden to the church he had planted in the city of Corinth. And dear Trinity Fellowship, I want you to know that I have endeavored to do the same thing. I've received money from other churches all over the world, from Castleview, from Sovereign Grace churches, to make all of this happen, so that I would not be a burden to you as your pastor. But here's the important thing for us to know as we build a culture in this church. Other pastors are coming after me. Pastors are being raised up like in the pastor's college. We're not going to go out and try to find them and hire them. They're here in this room. People like Brother Ebenezer. We want to be a generous church. We want the future pastors of Trinity Fellowship to be able to say what Paul says here. I am well supplied. Boasting. You, let me tell you about my church. My church gives. It gives with good motives. And my, my, my needs are all supplied. I am well supplied. We don't want our future pastors to be ministering halfway because they're spending their time trying to make enough money to feed their families. 
We want them to feel what Paul felt, that they are well supplied to the glory of God. What we find is that when our pastors are well supplied, God's happy. He's pleased. We give to God because it makes God happy. Our last motivation, motivation number four for giving to God, we give to God because we trust God. We give to God because we trust God. Here's where our faith is really put on display, or rather we can say the object of our faith is put on display. Look with me at text, at, in the text at verse 19. We find here that God will supply every need of yours according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This is a glorious promise for us, is it not? It's a, a, a deep and abiding promise. But we ought to rightly understand it. In fact, we need to be warned here. There's a warning here for us. Many of us have areas in our lives in which we feel we have great need, do we not? There's hurts. There's needs. Some of us have family members who are sick and we feel we need them to be healed. Some of us have money problems and we feel we need more money. Some of us have big questions, you might even say fear, with regards to the future. And we feel we need some answers, we need those answers right now. Some of us wrestle with really, really, really dark depression. We feel we need that darkness taken away right now. The question is this, is this verse promising that God will fix what we feel we need? Not necessarily. Sometimes what we feel we need is actually just a want. What we find is that sometimes what we need is actually discipline. Brother A.B. Or correction. Sometimes we may find that God is not, God will not give us what we want because He's in the business of actually giving us what we need. God is the great physician of our souls. He knows what we need more than we know. Sometimes we need to be broken so that He can fix us. Sometimes we need to be emptied so that we can be filled back up. Sometimes our prayers go unanswered so that other prayers that we've prayed may be answered. And here's the key to this verse. God will supply Every need in Christ Jesus. Those three words, those three words are crucial. In Christ Jesus. You see, often what we find is that our needs are not rooted in the person of Christ Jesus. But can you see here, can you see here in our text that that, that is what the great promise to us is. Verse 19 says, God will supply every need of yours according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Every need. Every need is every need, both great and small. Every need of yours. Every need of yours. The answer is found in Jesus. He himself. Not a theology, not a system of thought, not an idea, but in him, his person. Both great needs and small needs. Christian, have you trusted God to take care of your greater need. How much more now can you trust Him to take care of your lesser need? Somebody say, take us to the cross, Pastor. God knew your greatest need when you were still dead in your trespasses and sins. Your great need was to have your sin taken away and Christ's righteousness given to you. That that was your great need. And so Christ went to the cross to supply you with your greatest need. And there on the cross, Christ took your greatest need away because he, he bled out. He was completely drained out as an atoning sacrifice in our place. But you still had needs. You still had great needs. You see... You were born dead. You were born dead in your trespasses and sins. And as you went through life, you didn't even know that you needed to be regenerated. That means you needed to be born again. That heart of stone needed to be taken out. And the heart of flesh needed to be put 
in. You were dead. Dead with no ability to even trust in Jesus. You were a sinner who loved your sin. A rebel who delighted in your rebellion. But the Holy Spirit came to you and He gave you a new heart. And when He did, you believed in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that Christ dies for sinners. And you were saved. And the moment you believed, Christ gave you His own righteousness. That is, He credited to your spiritual bank account His very own righteousness. The righteousness of the second person of the Trinity. If you're a Christian, friend, listen to this. Your greatest need has been taken care of. Hallelujah! The question is this. You trusted Him with your greater need. Will you now in confidence trust Him to take care of your lesser needs? If the God of creation created you, if He supplied you in your bigger needs, will He not also supply you in your lesser needs? Oh, my friend, He will do it. He will supply your every need. And we give back to God. We give our money to God. We give our lives to God. We give our hearts to God because we trust Him. We trust Him today. And on that first day when we became a Christian, we trust Him today. We trust that it is not us who provide for ourselves. Yes, we're to work. But it's God who supplies all of our needs. We give to God because we trust God supplies us in our lesser needs. When we give to God, we're saying, I trust you, O Lord. I don't need this money in my pocket, as I'm tempted to think, because every good blessing comes down from you. You are my provider, and not this money in my pocket. My confidence for life is in you. Friends, can you believe that God has done such a work in our lives that we who once were so far off, we now have this strange ability to glorify the God of creation? Verse 20 ends with, To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we give to God because we are obsessed with His glory. And His glory is most climactically revealed at the cross in the free grace of God. We give to God because we are obsessed with the free grace of God to the glory of God. We give to God because we're obsessed with the good news of the gospel. Amen. Let's pray.